Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending the presentation entitled, What Are You Selling? Qualifications for a Tax Deferred Exchange presented by Tina Colson, Director of Business Development at Equity Advantage. We're so glad everybody's here. I think we have about 90 people registered for this presentation this morning. Wanna just give you a heads up. If you have any audio issue today, we have a tech person in the background helping Tina, and her name is Celia. And if you could call her at 503-635-1031, if you have any issues, and she'll get you set up and back plugged into the presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce the Chastel Real Estate Leadership Team. Uh, first, we have Mr. Brent Gunter. He's our founder and CEO at Chastel Real Estate. And then we have Lisa Melhoff, our VP of Agent Development, and then myself, my name is Ben Richardson, and I'm the Managing Principal Broker uh, for Oregon and also Washington. So we're licensed in both states and we're operational in both states. Um, at Chestel, we are you know, always looking out for our agents, we care about our agents, and we wanna equip them to be able to thrive in a changing market, any market actually, and also we care about our friends in the real estate industry and that's why we've invited you all today. Uh, hopefully we can all uh, benefit from this program, this presentation on 1031s. Uh, we're also gonna be hosting other events, other presentations like this one that are gonna be helpful to all of us. And so look out for those in the future. Uh, before we turn this over to Tina, I'd just like to maybe ask Brent a question and have to say a, a few brief words. Um, so Brent, after today, with this great information that we're gonna learn, what can we at Chastel do with it? What can we do with this information? How can we benefit from it? What do you think? That's a really good question, man. First of all, thanks for, for having me today. Uh, we're, we're excited to be here. So Chastel's a, a, a startup uh, here, here in the Portland area. We focus on helping successful clients uh, acquire and, uh, and, uh, and sell, buy and sell luxury real estate as, as well as investment property. So, uh, congratulations for being here, all of you who signed up for this CE class, because it's uh, it's probably one of the more useful uh, CE credits that you'll be able to get this year. So good job doing that. Um, you know, be, before uh, before we get started today, I wanted to uh, maybe do a little uh, uh, you know little little math joke. I know we're all going to be working on numbers and timelines, really serious IRS type stuff. Uh, so uh, so uh, what do you what do you have? If an agent uh, has two listings, and then she joins a uh, a, a really a really cool uh, tech-enabled startup brokerage and gets 14 listings, what do you have? Break out your calculator, figure that one out. You have happiness, of course. You have happiness. <laughs> uh, so here at Chastel, we want you to be happy. We want you to be able to help your clients in the best way possible, and and uh, you know, being being a 1031 exchange specialist is great. Even if you just know a little bit about it, you can always uh, bring them over to uh, to our friends, T Tina Colson at Equity Advantage. So, uh, you know, if you'd like to learn more about uh, developing uh, your business and attracting investors uh, to, to your business and becoming a specialist or uh, becoming, uh, you know, just, just being able to augment your business with investment properties and uh, with uh, luxury clients. We would love to chat with you. Be sure to reach out to Ben after this is over. Uh, he'd be uh, glad to you know, talk with you about how Chastel could help you. Uh, uh, thanks uh, to, to Tina Colson for talking today. And we're going to go ahead and hand it back over to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Ben, Lisa, and Brent. We really appreciate it. And thank you for bringing me in for this presentation today. Um, Oregon agents, please stick around with us through this whole presentation so we can give you the continuing education credits. Celia Moore with our company will reach out to you via email um, to get the information from you that we need for this. Again, my name is Tina Colson. I am a graduate of George Fox University. I have been in the real estate industry um, over 30 years. I'm dating myself, but I love it. And I have spent my time in title and escrow, in finance, real estate, and now have found my niche in 1031 Exchange. And I have been with this company, Equity Advantage, for a little over three years. Absolutely love it. And I cannot wait to share all the things that we can do in the 1031 world for you today. So whether you are working with a buyer or a seller, 
and there's an exchange involved, this is a great opportunity for you because it gives you the ability to double your involvement and double your paycheck. So that is one thing to consider. And also, if you are maybe selling something in this area and you are looking for, um, you know, your client is looking for property in Georgia, nationwide, we can help you nationwide. And your folks at Chastel can also help you by helping connect you with agents in that area for that referral fee. So keep that in mind. And let's try to get this rolling. I am going to um, take my camera down for myself and expand the uh, the video so you can see this full presentation on a full screen. And please also uh, place questions on the sidebar to the right. There is a question drop down. You can certainly uh, place your questions there, and I'm going to try to answer those as we go. And Celia is going to help me do that. So let's get started. Thanks so much. Okay, so here we go. What are you selling qualifications for a tax deferred exchange? So what is a 1031 exchange? It is IRS code 1031. It was created in 1921. The 1031 exchange is an IRS authorized process where like kind business or investment property is exchanged without the immediate tax liability to the property owner or who we call the exchanger. So what qualifies for 1031? It's a non-recognition of gain or loss from exchanges solely in kind. So in general, known gain or loss shall be recognized in the exchange of real property held for investment, such as property in exchange solely for another piece of real property of like kind, which we will discuss like kind in a little bit and that new property must also be held for investment. So the exception to the 1031 for real property held for sale, anybody who is flipping property, it does not qualify. We will talk about this in a little bit as well. Application for certain partnerships, if somebody is selling real property and they want to go into a membership of an LLC, that does not work with the 1031 exchange. However, we do have methods through Delaware Statutory Trust to get you into those membership uh, or partnerships later down the road, and we'll discuss that. And then also special rules for foreign real property. We can do United States to United States property, including Mariana Islands, Guam, and Virgin Islands, all qualify. If it is outside the US, we can do foreign property to foreign property. So if you have a Mexico um, home and you want to exchange that for another property in Mexico for investment, you can certainly do that. So who can benefit? Anybody who has held real property as an investment for a period of time. This could be an owner of vacant land, somebody who has a second home that they are not using that second home, uh, you know, for more than two weeks out of the year for the first two years prior to disposition. Uh, a person with a business component incorporated into their primary residence. And here's some, here's some things, maybe an additional dwelling unit, a home office, shop used for business, farmland, vineyard, all of this will apply and we'll get into some opportunities that talk about that as well later in this presentation. Exchange fallacies, more things that we're gonna cover. Like kind does not mean house for house, land for land. It's the nature of the investment, not the form of the investment. Section 1031 does not always require a two-year hold, which you may hear often. There is no limit to the number of properties relinquished and or received. You can carry a note or land sales contract and still do a 1031 exchange. You do not have to replace debt in a 1031 exchange. And 1031 exchange is not all or nothing. You can defer as much as you want. 
So gain is the biggest topic that we hear about. And most people, when they're calling in for exchange questions, they're thinking, hey, I may have 200,000 in gain on my property that I'm selling for 500,000. All I need to carry in the, in the 1031 exchange is that 200,000 in gain, carry it over to a no property. That is not correct. So uh, we will get into the napkin test which talks about how much you have to cover in a 1031 exchange for full tax deferral. But let's talk about the gain itself. What is gain? To calculate it, it's gonna be the adjusted sales price minus your basis. So there you have to figure out what your basis is on an investment property. So you're gonna look at the purchase price, how many improvements or cost of improvements that you put into this property that have not been already uh, deducted off of your taxes. And then you're also going to have depreciation recapture. So you need to subtract the depreciation that you've taken on that property over time. So that's gonna give you your adjusted basis, which then you look at that full sales price, less closing costs, and you're gonna make your calculation from there. I will make sure that everybody has this slide today so you can move forward and have that calculation at hand. So what is the tax hit? Again, we work nationwide, so we see tax hits all across um, different states at different levels. So in this slide, we've simply pulled the basics for our local area. So the amount of gain you pay depends on the state that is that you're in that you're selling out of and the type of tax that you're exposed to so each state has its own state tax that's applied on top of the federal tax and depending on the state of disposition and the type of gain combined rates can climb more than 50 percent so alternative minimum tax which is 26 to 28 percent that is only going to hit the high income earners but you also have to take into consideration when you have gain that gain is going to be shown as income to you so that's what's going to change all these numbers you will always have on the federal side appreciation at 20 percent depreciation at 25 percent and then of course your state tax so in Oregon, 9.9, .9, California, 13.3, Washington, they are still very fortunate that um, IRS has not come after them for the state gain yet. And then also healthcare. So this is a piece that Obama put into place. And again, if you're in a specific tax bracket, you may have an additional 3.8% on top of that. So things to keep in mind when we're doing these exchanges, we are deferring the tax on federal, state, and depreciation recapture. So what's your tax hit? Again, here's the nationwide picture. If you sell, let's say you sell in Oregon, Oregon has a great recapture um, clawback where they will track the property that you sold even if you purchase in Washington which is a no tax state for the sale of real estate that 9.9 percent that you deferred the tax on in Oregon to go purchase that Washington property in that scenario if you were to ever sell the Washington property and not do another 1031 exchange Oregon is going to claw back at the time of the sale of the Washington property and say, wait a minute, we want our 9.9% that you deferred back in 2023. So these are just some things to think about. The tax is going to snowball from one property to the next, but we do have some exit strategies that we'll go over in a little bit. So what's the four cornerstones of the exchange? Cornerstone number one, to be an exchange, something is given away and something is received. Again, the property being relinquished must have been held for investment for a minimum of a year is what we want to see at the time of sale. And the property that you're going to be purchasing is also going to be held for investment for a minimum of a year. Cornerstone number two. Items relinquished and received must be of like kind. So here's that like kind requirement again. 
you can sell a single family residence and you can purchase a multifamily, another single family, a vacation property. You can purchase land. You can even go into passive investments, which we will talk about in a little bit. So again, like kind is not the specific of what you're selling, but it's more the nature of what you're selling. Cornerstone number three, here comes the napkin test. So napkin test must be satisfied. You need to cover both the value of the property as well as the equity in order to have full tax deferral. So here's a couple examples of that. In example one, again, property A is what we're selling. This is our relinquished property. So we're gonna sell it at 700,000. And by the way, these numbers are just rounded. We're not getting into the nitty gritty. So we sell at 700,000 and you've got 400,000 in equity and a remaining mortgage balance of 300,000. So when you go to purchase your replacement property in the exchange, in example number one, you're going up in value up to 950,000. You're gonna use all of that equity from the sale of property A as the down payment on property B and you're going to simply get a mortgage to offset the difference of 550. In that scenario, you've got full tax deferral. So let's look at a scenario where you go down in value. So same scenario, you sell for 700, you've got 400,000 in cash and a 300,000 mortgage to pay off. So you sell property A, but now you go down in value by 650,000, you're still gonna use your full 400,000 from the proceeds of the sale as your down payment, and you get the difference in the mortgage of the 250,000. Because you went down in value, that creates boot. So what is boot? You've got $50,000 worth of it. Boot, nope, not a good pair of Timberlands, although I love myself a good pair of Timberlands. You're looking at tax. So tax is exactly um, calculated the same as the gain when you end up with that boot. So boot is unlike property received in an exchange. Cash, personal property, reduction in mortgage owed after the exchange, it's all boot and subject to tax. So by forecasting ahead of time as you're pre-planning for your sale and what you wanna purchase on the other side, we can look at that and see one, does an exchange make sense for you to do? And or do you need to restructure your transaction before committing to the deal? So again, replacing debt, you can offset mortgage boot with additional cash. In other words, come in with more cash than what you're gonna have mortgage on, but you cannot offset cash with additional mortgage. So here's an example of replacing debt. You sell a property for a million, you carry over 500,000 in cash for your purchase, and you've got a mortgage of 500,000 on that, on that sold property. So in the replacement property, if this scenario played out where you're still purchasing a property for a million, but you want to pull out $100,000 in cash, to do whatever with, pay down debt, um, existing debt on maybe another property. You need that $100,000 cash out of closing, you can do that. You add an additional 100,000 on your mortgage side, again, that 100,000 is going to be boot for you. The only way to be tax deferred, let's say you brought in additional, if you had the 500,000, you would still be fine for your down payment, but if you brought in an additional 100,000 to now make that mortgage a little less painful for you, and your new mortgage is only 400,000, you're still fully tax deferred. And again, we'll check if we have any questions coming in here. Can you check the questions too? So cornerstone number four, you must have continuity of vesting in this situation. So what does that mean? It means that the taxpayer selling must be the taxpayer purchasing on the other side. 
So in Oregon, we are a non-community property state, and this is one of the first things that we will ask when we're talking to our clients is what state do you live in? So non-community property state, here's an example. If you have a husband and a wife, they may be filing joint tax returns, but only the husband is on title because this may have been a house that he had before they got married. In that scenario, if the husband is selling the house, the wife cannot be on title to the new home in the exchange on the other side. So what do we do in that situation? Your options are A, you quit claim the wife to the property being sold prior to having it go under contract or closing at escrow. So now they're both on title to that property. They can move across in the exchange together to purchase the new property together. The other option is we close the relinquished property in the husband's name. The husband buys the new property solely in his name, and then he can add his wife to title once the transaction is fully complete. And again, we always say, you know, talk to your CPA, make sure CPA is on board anytime you do an exchange. So that's a good spouse um, scenario. If you have partners in a transaction, this is something we see a lot as well, is maybe there is an LLC and you have two members in that LLC, two brothers, and one brother wants to go his separate way upon sale. You can do what's called a drop and swap, which means the brothers are going to drop out of the LLC, drop that property out, they'll dissolve the LLC. They're going to hold title now as tenants in common. And then when they close that transaction as tenancy in common, it gives each person the ability to go their separate ways. One person can do an exchange with their 50% of the property. The other person can take the cash and pay the tax as they wish. So that is another scenario, or we can simply do the whole transaction for the LLC with both parties selling in that LLC entity and purchasing in that LLC entity on the other side. So tenancy in common, if you're going your separate ways, that is exactly how we want to see the title on that property. Let's talk about exchange types. So equity advantage, again, we've been doing this over 30 years. We offer absolutely every type of exchange that you can think of. So a delayed exchange is the most common. You're gonna sell a property and then you are going to buy your property later in a normal transaction. That's called a delayed exchange. A reverse exchange is used. We use it mostly for a backup plan, but in our crazy market that we've had the last few years, this became a popular option where they actually buy the property first that they want to hold, and then they'll sell their relinquished property later. That Reverse exchange, there are many things involved with it, and one is, as a client, you cannot retain title to both the old and the new property at the same time, so therefore we create a holding LLC, and we're going to park one of your properties, either the, the purchase or the relinquished property in that LLC during the exchange. We can also do an improvement exchange. You sell your property, and then you go find another property, but maybe that property needs 100,000 in improvements. You can purchase that property and then use the proceeds from your current sale to improve that property, make those capital improvements and still have that tax deferral. So you're using up your funds in that scenario. The next one is the leasehold improvement exchange. And this is where you're going to improve on property you already own. So again, there's more tricks to this one and it does take a lot of planning. So if you have somebody who owns property, they wanna build on that property or improve, um, they have to hold it for investment again. So um, that's another one that we can do, but more hoops are involved. Lastly, a blended, which is gonna be a combination of any of those exchange types that we just talked about. 
So it's all about pre-planning, making sure you've got your ducks in the row and uh, talking with your CPA, depending on what you want to do. Regardless of what type of exchange you do, there is always a timeline. So for any exchange, the first 45 day window and both of these 45 day and 180 day timelines begin upon the relinquished property closing date or the first property that closes in an exchange. So if you have a reverse, you still have the 180 day window to complete the exchange, but now that, that timeline is going to begin upon that replacement property closing date. So to keep it as simple as possible, if we were looking at a delayed exchange, your relinquished property closing date, from that date, you've got 45 days to identify the property that you want to purchase. And you've got a total of 180 days to close on that new property. So let's talk about identification of replacement property. There are three separate rules. They are all independent of one another. You can identify as many properties as you wish in an exchange, but again, it's gonna throw you into the separate rule categories. So let's start with the first and the easiest rule. If you're going to purchase one or two properties, stick with the first rule, which is A, up to three properties of any value. That gives you the most flexibility because we are not looking at the value. And identifying a property is simply meaning an ambiguous address. You're out shopping for property. You see 123 B Street that you would like to purchase in the exchange. You're going to receive this identification page and you're going to write in on that page 123 B Street. That is your identification. So let's say you want to purchase multiple properties in the exchange. If you identify four or more properties on that identification page, it throws you into category B, the second rule. You can identify multiple properties, but now you need to add up the fair market value of every property identified, and you do not want to exceed 200% of the property value that you just sold. So if you sell a $500,000 property and you've identified four properties in the exchange and they are a million dollars in total value, you're good. You can still I you can still close on one or more of those properties identified. If that added up value of all properties exceeds a million dollars, now you are thrown into the C category, which means you've exceeded the 200%, you're over a million dollars of all of those properties added up together that you've identified, meaning you are now having to close on 95% of everything that you identified or it will blow your whole exchange. So that, C category has only been used a couple times that I know of, and they were very prepared in their exchange and they actually pulled it off. Most people will stick to A or B, um, but again, if you're under three properties, stick to the first rule, which is up to three properties of any value. Again, you have the most flexibility with that one and it's easier to pull off. Identifying property and release of funds. This is another sticky wicket that we run into. So here's what can happen in that 45 day window is if you do not find anything that you wish to purchase in that 45 days, don't identify anything. Cancel your exchange on day 45 and we can release the proceeds to you on day 46. By the way, this is a G6 rule requirement with the IRS. This is not our rule of when we can release the funds. So don't find anything, day 46 will send your money back to you. So what happens if you identify property and it falls through within the 45 day window? 
you have full flexibility to replace it. So go ahead and throw another property um, on that identification page and submit that to us by day 45 at midnight and we can continue to close on that property that you've replaced it with. The last thing and the worst case scenario, you identify property, let's say you only have one property on that identification page, we're past the 45 day window and now all of a sudden due to inspection or whatever other cause that property falls through and we do not have anything else to close on. So if that is the scenario, now money is going to be tied up in the exchange and we cannot release it until day 181. So when you're identifying properties, I always suggest get something under, co under contract that you feel comfortable with by day 45, and that's what you want to identify. We have had folks that identify property and, um, and then they end up trying to close on something else. That does not work. Uh, we have property that falls through after day 45 and the funds are tied up and it puts that person in a tight situation financially. So this is very, very important with this 45 days and the identification process. So let's look at why an exchange is so valuable to people today and every day for the last hundred years, I can say. So an investor in this situation, you've got one, per one person who is an investor, you've got another person who sells a property outright in a general sale. So for this particular case, we had each investor purchasing a property for 400,000, the property depreciated by 100,000, which give gives them an adjusted basis of 300,000, and now they're selling it for 750,000. They have a remaining loan balance of 250,000. So combined tax exposure for federal, state, and depreciation recapture is at 40%. So now we're gonna break it down. Capital gain, top line, you sell a property for 750,000, and you've got your adjusted basis of 300,000, which gives you now capital gain on $450,000. So the impact of tax on the 450 at 40% 40 is 180,000. Down below, this is where the comparison comes in and why the exchange is valuable. So the sales proceeds less after selling and the mortgage is paid off, you've got 500,000 that you're carrying across. So in a general sale off of that 500,000, client A who does not do an exchange is going to have to pay $180,000 cash out of pocket, which leaves them with 320 for the next investment, 320,000. If you do an exchange, that same $500,000 that comes out of closing, they're not paying tax on, but they're going to defer it over through the exchange, which leaves them with $500,000 left to play with. So now as an agent, you're going out, you're shopping for that new property, and to be fully tax deferred, that client needs to spend the full $750,000 net, net of closing costs um, at least to be fully tax deferred and use the full 500,000 as the down payment. So if each investor uses his or her cash to purchase the property and they're putting 25% down, the seller can purchase a property valued at 1.28 million. That's the person who does not do the exchange. Whereas the exchanger would be able to purchase a property valued at 2 million. So this is where the exchange comes into play because it's simply giving you more capital to improve and increase on your investment side. So here's the question, what are you selling? Is it a primary residence or is it a business? Is it a section 1031 property? So section 121 was created for primary residents. And as far as the requirement, as long as you hold that property and live in that property for two of the preceding 
five years, an aggregate of that as a primary residence. You can sell the property, you can receive the cash, you don't have to reinvest anything, equity is not relevant, loan is not relevant, and you are not held to any timelines, but you can get the universal exclusion of gain as a primary residence, which we'll talk about in a minute. If you're under section 21, so it's all about what that property is at the time of disposition. If it's an investment property used in trade or business, you have requirements that it has to be held for investment. It does qualify for exchange property if that investment had been held for a year. There are specific times where we have, we have um, sold a property that was held less than a year, but it's rare. And then you also have the timeline. You've got your 45 days to identify property, the total of 180 days to close on that new property in the exchange. An exchanger cannot receive actual receipt of funds, cash, check, escrow, any of that in the exchange. Otherwise, that is going to be taxable to them as boot. During this uh, 1031 exchange, you also must reinvest at an equal or greater value for full tax deferral. You must use all of your equity for full tax deferral and the loan at least of equal value or greater. The, the general idea in that, like we had shown previously, is whatever the difference is between your purchase price and how much cash you're bringing to the table, you just need to cover that with either additional cash or an additional mortgage. So let's talk about, again, that Section 21, universal exclusion of gain for any primary residence. So in the situation where a person has a primary residence, they have lived in the property for a minimum of two years, out of the preceding five, a single individual can receive 250,000 exclusion of gain. So they don't need to pay that tax on the 250,000. If it is a married couple filing a joint tax return, they can go up to 500,000 for that exclusion of gain. So that is the first thing that we look at if there is a primary residence. Um, we're going to get into also what happens when you combine the 121 with the 1031. So here it is. Spy, spouses filing jointly purchased a property as a primary residence for 200000 lived in the home eight years. They purchased a new primary residence and decided to rent the home out for the last two years. The new current value is 800000 no debt adjusted basis of 175,000, which gave them 625,000 in gain that they were looking at. So when you go to sell this property, what is it at the time of the sale? It's a rental property for them. The first question you need to ask is, well, have you lived in this property at all? And how long did you, how long ago did you live in that property and for how much time? So this particular situation, they lived in the home for two of the preceding five years prior to sale. They can use both the 121 and 1031. In option one, if they want to simply sell the property, not do an exchange, they can receive 500,000 exclusion of gain, and then they just have to pay the tax on the remaining 125,000. Option two, they can purchase at an equal or greater amount for full tax deferral by using the exchange because that property that they sold was an investment at the time of sale. So now they purchase another investment property for equal or greater value. They can take 500,000 out in cash of that relinquished property closing, defer the balance of tax through the exchange. Or option three, they can go down in value and still have full tax deferral by using the exchange. So they purchase an investment property for let's say 300,000 using the cash from the sale and they keep the additional 500,000 cash and they have no tax exposure on that because again, their current home value was 800,000. 
so they could either take the cash and pull um, and purchase another property at 800,000 or greater, or they can go down in value by that 500,000, which allows them to purchase that property for 300,000, the same scenario. So seller financing is another component that we uh, get often, especially in today's world as sellers are getting creative and trying to sell their properties and buyers are facing the higher interest rates. So you can carry a note in the exchange, but there are some different rules to that. So if you carry a note as a seller, you can sell the note to the third party. In that scenario, when you sell a note to the third party, you're going to have a discounted rate typically. So you would end up with tax on the discount by selling that note. You can use a note to acquire a replacement property. So let's say you are wanting to carry a $200,000 note and as the exchanger, you are talking with the seller of the property that you want to purchase. If that seller is willing to take the note as part of this purchase or sale to them, that does work and that would be full tax deferral. A short-term note can be paid off prior to the replacement property being closed on. So that works and that will give you full tax deferral because you're bringing in the cash prior to completing your exchange. And then the other thing too that works well is if you are carrying a note as a seller, let's say you have a $100,000 note that you're gonna carry and at that point, when you come into escrow, you can bring in an additional $100,000 cash to closing, which makes that note whole. Now you can carry the note moving forward. You don't need to sell it. You don't need to use it on the purchase side. And you can move forward collecting the interest over those years to come. Conversion of property. So again, you can sell or purchase as many properties you want in any one given exchange. The, the toughest part is that timeline that we're looking at. So maybe you've got several rental properties that you wanna sell, or maybe you've got uh, many doors in an apartment complex that you're selling, and you really just wanna find a home that's going to be a great Airbnb, and then someday you can move into it, right, as your retirement home. So in this scenario, you can sell multiple properties and purchase one beautiful lakefront, beachfront property and convert it to your primary someday. How long is long enough? I mentioned a year. A lot of people will say two years. Two years is definitely, you know, the safest of all, but it depends on the circumstance. There is nothing in the IRS rule that states that you have to hold a property for two years prior to selling to qualify for the exchange, unless there are, you know, a couple different scenarios, which I will talk about here in a minute. But there was a a uh, scenario where someone had purchased investment property, they tried to rent it out, and unfortunately could not get it rented out in a timely manner. They carried the property for four months, and then they had to sell their primary, get the exclusion of tax on their primary, move into the 1031 investment property, and they actually won that court case because of the financial hardship that they faced. I would not suggest doing this, um, you know, in their situation, they were fortunate to win that case, but it could be ugly if you ended up moving into a property um, prior to holding it as an investment for a full year and doing the 1031, because you would end up paying back not only the 1031 tax that was deferred, but you would also probably have some penalties on top of that and you've paid for an exchange. 
So that is something to think about. But if you hold it for a minimum of a year, and the reason why we say that is one, it takes you from short-term ordinary income tax to long-term gain tax. So long-term gain is gonna be better for you. Uh, it also shows your intent because 1031 is all about the intent of what you do with that property. So holding it for a year as an investment, you are showing that intent as well. Second homes do have a two year hold um, and it is for both the relinquished property. If the relinquished property is a second home, you wanna minimize your use for 14 days per year for the first two years prior to disposition. You also wanna have it rented out for 14 days per year for the two years prior to disposition. Um, if you do not have it rented out, that is fine, but you lose the safe harbor provision, meaning that if for some reason you were audited, IRS is gonna dive deeper into your case. If it was rented out for fair market value for those 14 days per year for the two years prior to sale, they're going to leave you alone because that gives you the safe harbor. The same rules apply if you purchase a second home on the replacement side. Related party also has two year hold. Um, this is you know, something that's common. We may get a son who calls us who says, I have an investment property, I wanna sell it, and I want to purchase my mom's primary residence and then she can just rent it back for her days, right? Unfortunately, that does not work because one, it is a related party transaction and mom, that is her primary residence. If it is a investment property that mom held for investment and the son wants to sell his investment property to purchase his mother's investment property, that could work in an exchange as long as mom is also willing to do an exchange with her investment property to purchase another property on her side. Who makes up these rules? Great question, IRS. So both parties must hold their new replacement party for a minimum of two years prior to selling in the future. That is your related party transaction. Dealer status, again, flipping does not work. So the best thing to do, you know, if you've got somebody who maybe buys um, land in an exchange, they want to develop that land and then start selling off the lots or build a house on each lot, sell the house off of each lot, um, that is not going to work in the 1031 exchange. It does not qualify. However, if somebody decides to purchase a piece of property, develop that property, they could either develop all of the lots, bring in the utilities, have it ready to go, and then sell it as one chunk, one parcel for another developer to come in and build those homes. That works. The other thing that will work is if a person buys the property, they subdivide it, bring in the utilities, they build a house, and as those houses are built, they hold each house as a rental for one year period. Now they can sell off each house as its own parcel in the 1031 exchange, and that does work. So let's go through a few opportunities. Opportunity one, 121 and 1031. Again, this is a combined use property. So the property owner and their spouse lives on a farm and decides to retire and sell the property. Basis is under 50,000 and the property is now worth 1.2 million. So they've got that over 1 million in gain. What is the solution to that? We look at the allocation for the farmhouse that they're living in versus the working land that goes along with that. So the farmhouse receives the section 121 universal exclusion of gain treatment up to 500,000 for that couple living in that house while the working land falls into section 1031. So the taxpayer is gonna work with their tax counsel and you as the agent to say what is the established value that maximizes the 
effectiveness of both tax codes. So when this sale closes, residential allocation is received by the taxpayer who takes full benefit of the universal exclusion limits while the balance is 1031 treatment. What does that look like? 1.1 adjusted sales price, we're gonna put 500,000 exclusion of gain, which is allocated to their primary residence, the 121 code. And then they have 600,000 that is allocated to 1031. And now they can move that 600,000 forward and purchase something um, that is either another piece of property that they wanna sit on, rent out, or they can go into a passive investment. Opportunity two. 1031 into a personal property. I kind of mentioned this earlier. So there's a guy who owns a duplex. And he's nearing retirement. He's interested in selling and moving to the desert, but would like the replacement property to be a primary residence. He cannot move into that property right away. But if he does a 1031 on the duplex, he purchases his forever home on the replacement side in the desert where he's always wanted to be. He's gonna rent that home out for a year. It could be short or long-term rental. And then he can convert it to a primary residence after that year long period and enjoy it for his retirement days. End games. So these are scenarios that allow an investor to exchange into a final investment without going into another property that they are going to manage themselves. So Delaware Statutory Trust is a portfolio of commercial properties. Typically, it could be storage units, it could be hospitality suites, hotels, um, medical buildings. There are a multitude of DST products out there. Um, but you can exchange from your personal, um, you know, real property that you're holding and managing into one of these Delaware statutory trusts. And I would say a conservative investment on the DST side, you're probably going to get anywhere from four to maybe 7% payout on those. Those cycle through about every five to seven years. You can exchange back out of them into another uh, piece of property that you want to manage or into another Delaware statutory trust portfolio. The other thing that can happen with the DST product is sometimes the sponsors of those uh, portfolios will offer an UPREIT, an Umbrella Partnership Real Estate Investment Trust. You can exchange from the DST into the UPREIT product but once you're in an upreit, after about three to five years, that is going to cycle through and become a REIT, a real estate investment trust. When that happens, you are no longer able to exchange out of it because it is going to become shares. So now you can liquidate those shares over time and pay the gain as you liquidate. It just gives you a longer, um, a longer stint to liquidate that investment and not have a full hit of capital gains all up front. The other option you can go into is oil and working interest. Um, and that has become very popular over the last couple of years as well. So we, what we do on our end is we will help connect you with the brokers who handle those specific investments. And again, it's just an end game tool for folks that um, are looking at retirement and wanting that mailbox money instead. Okay, so we put the lime in the coconut. Now what do you do? <laughs> so as an agent, you need to make sure that you have, if it is a 1031 exchange, language in the purchase and or sales agreements that you are working with. So ask your buyer the questions, you know, what are you selling if it falls into the 1031 category? I know a lot of you now have this standard language in the contracts, just make sure it's in there. Um, but it allows us to come in the middle of this exchange and act on the buyer's behalf as the seller 
and also act on their behalf as the buyer. So the, really the only difference that you're gonna see with the 1031 exchange is when you get the settlement statement from this property, equity advantage is gonna show up as the seller on the property, only on the settlement statement. Same with the purchase side. We will show up as the buyer on a settlement statement for the purchase. So that's the difference. We hold the money on our side, and I can assure you, you know, there's been some news flashes out there about the collapse of tech banks. So I just wanted to address this really quick. Silicon Bank, Signature Bank, Silvergate Bank, what happened? Well, they've made poor investments into cryptocurrency, high-risk startups. Um, I can assure you that we vet our banks very well. The money that we carry stays in the bank account. It is not invested in any other way. And the banks that we use have reassured us time and time again that you know they are not in any of this type of investment pool. So I just wanted to let you all know that. And then also, we have President Biden's 2024 budget proposal that I'm sure many of you have heard of and or uh, will be hearing of in the near future. So how does it affect 1031 exchange? It is simply um, stating that the deferral of gain up to an aggregate amount of $500,000 per taxpayer or a million dollars in the case of married individuals filing a joint return each year for real property that exchanges are like kind. So what they're doing is they're capping it at that $500,000 limit or $1 million limit. So if you're carrying a property that is, you know, maybe you're, you're carrying a commercial property or, um, you know, several fourplexes that you want to sell off, and your gain is now in excess, at, excess of that 500,000 or million dollar figure for a married couple filing jointly, you're gonna end up paying the tax upon anything that is in excess of that 500,000 or a million. And again, that's per year. So um, structuring, if for some reason, if this does go through, you just wanna make sure that you are maybe spreading out the sales in different tax years so you can capitalize on um, that deferral of gain as you move forward. Um, whoops, hold on, we need to back up. So the FEA has built a strong defense and you know, 1031 has been on the chopping block probably three times in the last hundred years. And most recently, um, I feel like this is the, the strongest point that they are pushing, but we feel pretty safe because FEA has built a strong defense, but we always need your help. Reach out to your representative, your congressman to fight for section 1031. We've got a lot of people in the game. Um, when it comes to real estate, and we just need to be on the forefront of this one. So send a letter to Congress telling them 1031 like kind exchanges matter, and you can find the updated grassroots letter on the Take Action page of the FEA, which is the Federation of Exchange Accommodators um, Advocacy website, 1031buildsamerica.org. We appreciate that. Lastly, I just want to give you a quick look at our websites so equity advantage 1031 exchange we also have ira advantage our sister company which is self-directed ira navigation allowing you to use your ira funds to purchase real estate no loans metals other investments outside of wall street and then also a post 1031 which is our exchange property search so here's just a quick glance equity advantage there's many youtube videos on there um, you can also access our ira videos from this site too but we have many resources for you and then our ira advantage again both video libraries are up for your review and the post 1031. So this is a website that we created over a decade ago for our investors who are in the 1031 um, you know, business of, of deferring their property tax. And they were asking, how do I seek properties all across the nation? Well, this is how you do it. So you can post a free listing up there if you want 
to um, you know create a featured listing there is just a minimal fee I think it's twenty dollars but you can go up to the listing packages and see what opportunities are there for you you can also search for properties for your clients and um, and hopefully somebody across the states will reach out to you if you put a posting on there that they want to purchase one of your properties for their investors Thank you again um, to Chastel for hosting this webinar today. Um, I have one question that I wanted to bring up that came up. Two, can two members of an LLC do a 1031 exchange in separate purchases using 50% of the gain? So that question, if you have two members in an LLC, they can certainly purchase multiple properties in the LLC name with 50%, so splitting the proceeds from the sale. They can do that. Um, if they want to go their separate ways, then they certainly need to drop out as tenants in common, and then they can take their money and go their separate ways and purchase as many uh, properties as they wish to uh, purchase in that. We will be sending out a copy of the presentation that will be emailed to you. And um, thank you for your questions on that. And then also, you know, Chastel has great ideas as to how to find investors. So please reach out to that team. And, um, you know, again, even if someone